Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. is a name that is unfortunately ubiquitous in American poetry. Her awards, including the Pulitzer Prize, have immortalized her into the American poetry landscape. And again, unfortunately, this shows how mediocre poetry has become in the late 20th and 21st century, barely an art form any longer. Even the poets who have gotten some praise in the way of institutional money and approval are abandoning it for mediocre novels, it seems. Everybody's writing one. But Old's book, Odes, from 2016, is yet another example of the decay that has stricken contemporary poetry. Middle-aged and elderly women rehashing vague political moralities from almost a century ago. Feminism, a big theme in this one, and really one of the only themes. Some of aging, some references to wrinkles and stretch marks and spider veins, but all are done in so playful a way that it doesn't strike any bone or meaning in the heart of a reader. I'd even go as far as to call this collection of poetry childish, a repetitive broken record that keeps playing the same song page after page. In fact, there are nine poems in this collection about vaginas. Nine. And all of them say the exact same thing. Some vague reference to losing virginity in the repetitive phrases of torn hymens. Some righteous references to period blood, etc. It felt after a while that each poem was about the exact same thing. There is a vague mother in the poems who might as well be assumed to be Old's mother. There is no secret about it. In fact, Olds seems intent on beating the confessional mode to death, with no artistic prose even attempting to hide or make universal the mother in the poems. But the mother is merely referenced through the words beat or beatings, and of course, her vagina and uterus and breasts, and that's it one-dimensional little bits of things that repeat constantly and not in a good way, listeners. The book is divided into sections, but of course it isn't clear why. There is no thematic or subject change between the sections. It's all just a random jumble of odes. And the simple yet surprisingly uncreative title of the collection odes seems to sum up the level of effort that went into such a collection of poetry. The creativity that is sorely lacking from these jumbled masses of sentences. And it is just that, listeners, a jumble of poems that are called odes, but of course resemble the form in no way whatsoever. Merely a title insisting they are, in fact, odes. Well, I beg to differ. These are confessional poems, just as every single book of poetry that has come out in the last 50 years has been. More of the same, wasting paper 
wasting trees and oxygen to print the same things over and over again. And more importantly, wasting my time and effort and energy. I've recently been reading a lot of Anne Sexton for this podcast, listeners, and it was striking how much Olds appears to wish she were Sexton. Sexton's feminism is so unlike that of Olds, and it's really something to behold reading the two side by side. And that is because Olds' feminism is the feminism at the end of history, as the phrase goes, a repeated idea from a century ago, repeated from writers like Sexton and others, a hollow stance taken that pretends that the shame of an abortion was anything close to the level in the time of Anne Sexton and Plath and the rest of the confessional greats. It is feminism filtered through a syndicated rerun TV show, emptied of its daringness and meaning, and repeated from, and I hate to say this, listeners, social media timelines. 2016 was the year that the world began to run entirely through machines, that of social media softwares, what I often refer to as addiction softwares where many, and especially artists, have become little repeater machines, unable to upgrade or download new ideas and new convictions. And this collection of poetry, if it can be called poetry, is a prime example of the sickness of stubborn, stuck, repeated tropes that has infected contemporary literature now. This book is almost a decade old and is saying nothing any different than what was said in the 1960s by great poets like Sexton or Plath. So much so that this book struck me more as a random assortment of pasted together ideas and themes, hardly odes, apart from the titles insisting they are. And because of that, they feel hollow, empty, barely getting an idea across, apart from the vague references to body parts. This book might as well be called Ode to Sex Organs. The references are playful in the first few poems as one reads through, but quickly become tedious and boring, repetitive. For example, Ode to the Penis, one of the first few poems in the collection, reads as incredibly insecure. What's worse is that it says very little at all. There is some attempt to make meaning out of it. To give Olds the benefit of the doubt, it appears she is trying to say something about penises and vaginas are equal. Equal in what isn't specified or explored. Merely the statement is what ends the poem. Equal in pleasure? Maybe. Equal in performance? Maybe. It isn't clear. As I said several times already, these poems are pretty vague, dear listeners. I'd call most of these poems overwritten monstrosities, as if Olds was just going through the motions in older age, platitudes repeated from the previous generation. Sure, Occasionally, there is a good line of poetry in this book, some figurative language actually being used to describe something or make it new and fresh, an example being Ode to the Condom. But that poem is also destroyed by Olds' own carelessness in craft, it seems to me. And that's the word for these poems. Careless. So insistent on the vague platitudes from a previous generation that most of the works in this collection lose the plot and begin to repeat themselves. And this is an incredibly long collection of poetry, a hundred pages of poetry. And as I said, nine of those poems are about the same thing, vaginas. And I have no problem with feminist poems or poems about vaginas, listeners. I'm no prude. I'm not someone who clutches pearls. I just wish the vagina poems and references that fill this book 
would actually say something. Maybe about virginity, maybe about motherhood, sisterhood, the work of reproducing, the commitment, the life-changing events. But they don't. They all simply repeat the platitude, I am vagina, hear me roar. Something that was cool and fresh and interesting and funny in the 1980s and 1990s, perhaps. But in 2016 is simply tired, tedious, and yes, boring. Old has never been one to even notice line breaks. Her large body of work and career has been plagued with poor construction for decades. Of course, that never seemed to matter. And of course, I will go into detail about a few when we get further into the episode, dear listeners. But for someone of Old's caliber... It seems pathetic at this stage in her career to have never learned the difference between a good line break and a bad one. Beyond the poor and seemingly random structures of the poems, Olds is plagued by a humorlessness of someone who is unfunny, but believes themselves to be, despite it all. Blowjob Ode, the title a joke in itself, says nothing about blowjobs, sexual pleasure, or anything else. The joke of the poem is supposed to be the literalness that Olds attempts to use to deconstruct, and I say that in air quotes, listeners, the phrase for the sex act, the literal term blowjob. Going on at length about it being called a job, This is, of course, the intended joke, listeners, and results in one of the lamest poems I've ever read about blowjobs. Old lady humor. Again, careless. Not saying anything in particular about the act or the power dynamic. No, no, no. That would require some effort, some thinking through. And of course, thinking something through, like line breaks, for instance, is not old style. Brashness is filling in for artistic merit in this case. But as she wrote this book approaching her 60s, she failed to remember that brashness is a young writer's game. That as one ages, literal jokes that require the horrid Gen X trend of deconstruction, jokes about the sex one isn't having, is really a poor choice in terms of meaning making. Resorting to cliches, which again can only be interpreted as a lack of effort on Old's part, a carelessness the loudest person in the room seems to be constantly able to get away with in contemporary literature. I've said this before, but I'll say it again, listeners. It is a very sad state in publishing for all genres, but especially poetry. There is not a single editor on staff at any publishing house, including Knopf, who put out this awful book of poems that can work with a poet to make the best book possible. That type of relationship no longer exists. An Odes by Sharon Olds is just another piece of evidence in the dwindling importance and artistic craft that poetry has declined to. Bored to death reading this overly long collection of random and poorly crafted musings, it was a chore to finish. If I hadn't been reading it for this podcast, I would have stopped reading after the first 10 pages or so. In fact, I couldn't bring myself to finish the last five pages, so distraught by the awfulness of it all. The careless musings of someone where the I in the poetry is exactly the writer. There's no mystery, no poetic craft to heighten or bury the raw confession, or in Old's case, random thoughts on paper, not even confession. Descriptions of things seen out a window, memories. Most of these odes, again, her word for the poems, not mine, are barely praising anything, which is why I used the term insecure earlier. 
not only because of how repetitive the poems are as the collection plays out, but because they don't seem to be giving new life and joy to any of the subject matter. And I could tell you that that is because these poems don't actually follow a subject or theme. They are merely random thoughts and associations of Olds herself, mixed in with a good line here and there. But I'm sure someone can make a poor argument that these supposed odes praise something, vaginas, I guess. But even then, the poems that attempt to praise the female sex organ are mostly concerned with the blood and guts of it all. Not the joy of womanhood, the joy of power, of creating life or carrying children, the power of a woman and her vagina, or what it represents in the 21st century. No, they are preoccupied with menstrual blood and the hymen tearing, so much so that there are two poems about the hymen. Again, a repetitive book if I've ever read one. And I can already hear the grunts of feminists exclaiming something along the lines of, how dare a man tell us what to praise about our bodies? Or something like that. I assure you, I don't care what you praise about your bodies, how you have sex, or how any given woman talks about anything at all. I just want the poems to say something, anything, actually be an ode to something. I reiterate for those who still don't understand, I am talking about the poetry on the page, not anything else. My complaints merely suggestions to create some form of meaning beyond the simple-minded and rah-rah I'm a woman tropes that are repeated endlessly in these poems. And I'll leave off with something else, listeners since this has been so negative. I don't like to not enjoy poetry collections, dear listeners. I want to be seduced by them, intrigued and inspired by them. I want to like them. I want each book I pick up to blow me away. It's pages absolutely captivating me to keep reading. But Sharon Old's book of random, jumbled thoughts and platitudes from another century that she is calling odes is not that. In fact, it's nowhere close. Heavy. Bored. Woof. All right, let's get a few hits here on the vape. Ooh, a little hungover this morning, but we're dealing with it. You know what I mean, folks? All you listeners out there. Had a good time. Had a good time last night with a few drinks. But uh, let's get to the episode. So, welcome to another episode of Heavy Board. Uh, I'm Andrew Wittstadt, and today we are talking about Sharon Old's book, Odes, from 2016. A very long and meandering book of poetry, if I've ever read one. Um, I can't remember when I picked this one up, but... Let's go through the let's go through and talk about the the specifics. So yes, this was published originally in 2016 by uh, Kanaf. Uh, Barry, even the cover when you look at it, um, and this was uh, apparently the fourth printing in July of 2017 is the first is this edition I have. But um, even the cover of this, like it looks like almost like a self published book. It's literally nothing but just white blank. And it just says Odes, Sharon Olds. And I guess this was 2016, you know, so the people were competing with, like, the likes of, you know, mediocre and or straight-up awful poets like Rupi Carr and uh, all of those. So maybe that's what the designer was going for. Or maybe the designer got the same thing I got out of this book, which is almost nothing. But that being said, right, as I said in the monologue there, there's some, you know, there's some decent lines. I'm not going to say that she doesn't know how to write a good line every once in a while. There are. Um, but then the line breaks usually ruin it. Um, and then they usually, you know, that, that good line is usually so buried within there. We'll get to some examples here. But it's usually so buried within the poems that they it ends up not mattering. You know, can't save uh, the work. But, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <clears throat> Let's get a little coffee. Let's get a little vape.
First things first, let me do a little housekeeping here. I keep forgetting to do this. Uh, this is a podcast. You can support it. Subscribe at patreon.com slash heavy board, where you will receive full uncensored episodes like this. Um, you'll be able to talk to me. I actually just started Patreon just uh, included chats because Patreon is, I don't know what they're doing over there. They, they, they don't know what they're getting usurped by other um, you know, uh, private subscription platforms like Substack and things. And you really, they still suck at being able to put out written content and stuff. Um, but I just started a chat. So there is a chat now for the general support. So when you're on the single ply tier, there is a group chat now for everybody involved in that, where we can come and have chats. You can put your thoughts about a book on here. You can make suggestions, requests for me, uh, books or guests that you'd want to see on this podcast. Um, I will say though, uh, if you're <laughs> some guests refuse to respond to me, so, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll reach out to them usually, but they, they don't, uh, they don't always respond to me. So, uh, you know, can't always, can't always guarantee it, but of course you can make your request there and you, you know, basically I like it because it gives you access to me and, uh, and, and other people in this podcast, you know, make some friends, make some friends out there. I know it's always a little awkward. Uh, you know, we don't know each other, blah, 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 but, uh, you know, jump in, make some friends, make this a community. It's what we've been trying to build this whole time here. At least I have at Heavy Board. And because of these chats, there's also now, if you're in the double ply tier or above, you do have access to what I'm calling the Heavy Board Book Club. And uh, we're going to have our first meeting probably in a month or so. I haven't worked out the dates yet. But there has a private chat as well where you can put in, you know, same thing, suggestions. We can talk about these books. Um, what's going to be happening in the book club and what we're going to do with that. And those episodes will be recorded and released on the podcast. So if you want to participate in Heavy Board, you know, come sign up and uh, we got you. All right. And if you don't want to do any of that, you don't want to do it, can't, can't afford it, don't want to subscribe on Patreon, there are other ways you can support this podcast. You can check us out on YouTube. Subscribe, like, share with your friends and family. We are uh, at Heavy Board for the main channel where all free episodes go up. And we are at Heavy Board Clips for clips and shorts and all that kind of shit. Uh, give those a like. Give those a share. Give those a subscribe. It's a free way to support us. It helps us out. It helps us grow. So we really appreciate it. You know, uh, Links to everything is in the description. As always, we'll have this book linked and anything else we touch on in this podcast. And click those links, guys, if you do because uh, that helps this podcast as well. Again, a free way to support us. Click those links and uh, buy something. Uh, if not the book that we cover, uh, just buy something through those links because uh, it helps the channel out, helps it grow. We appreciate it. Uh, and then another free way to support us. And of course, workshop stories, still on the lookout for that. You can contact me, heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. Give us a little contact or just say, hey, what's up? You know, sometimes... Uh, Ask me, you know, you can request books that way if you're not a member of the chats uh, on Patreon. So you can request books or guests that way. I'm, I'm always open to that. Or you just want to say, hey, what's up? I've even had people send me emails where they, you know, give me lengthy disagreements. So if you're into that, please, you know, send it. Uh, I uh, usually do a segment when I get enough to, uh, for, for subscribers, a little bonus episode that I'll do where uh, I usually do where we, uh, you know, just when I get enough emails, just kind of go through it and, and read some of the sections and, and talk about it. And, you know, a lot of times they're pretty fair objections. So, uh, you know, don't be shy. Reach out. Let's make a community here. Uh, and that's everything for housekeeping, I believe. Yeah. Of course, I always forget fucking something. So we'll see. But that's it. But let's get into this book here. Sharon Old's Odes. I was worried that was going to be confusing when... uh. We do this shit. But if you don't know who Sharon Olds is, pretty famous figure in contemporary poetry. She teaches at NYU. And uh, here, let me just skim through the bio for those that don't know. Yeah. Uh, San Francisco native, went to Stanford, Columbia, won the Pulitzer Prize, T.S. Eliot Prize. Um, just published a bunch of books. Uh, I think she was uh, awarded the National Book Critics Circle Award. Um... Lamont Poetry Selection, 
uh, National Book Award, finalist for National Book Award, but never got it. Um, and of course, she teaches at NYU in the graduate school there and uh, all that kind of shit. Uh, although based on this book, again, somebody like Olds in a MFA, um, she's going to help you more uh, with connections than she is uh, making you a good poet. At least that's my judgment based on the st all of her books. I've only read a few of her books, but I will do this one because it's a little more contemporary. Uh, if you guys want, again, put it in the comments, put it in the chat, put it in an email. Um, I can go into, uh, maybe we'll do something like that for the book club. We'll do one of her more famous, you know, her Pulitzer Prize winning book and stuff. But one thing with all of her poetry, the line breaks. Mm. Which is, I mean, they're atrocious for somebody of her caliber. Uh, absolutely atrocious. And, you know, I've mentioned Diane Seuss on this podcast before. Diane Seuss is a poet. Diane Seuss, hey, come on the podcast, who uh, I greatly admire, uh, even when I think some of her work fails or isn't as good. I think she is structurally brilliant, uh, is very careful in her structures and things like that. So I really think... Um, you know, if you're confused about what I'm talking about with line breaks, read some of Sharon old stuff and then go read it compared to Diane Seuss's stuff. You know, it's uh, uh, it's night and day, listeners. It's night and day, uh, really. Uh, I mean, there's some parts in here that I'll get into as we go into some poems, but yeah. All right. So uh, my first note that I wrote in this was, might as well be called Ode to Sex Organs. And I put this in the monologue. Yeah, playful at first, then tediously boring. A copy of Sexton, but without the skill. And maybe that's just me comparing it to Sexton because I'm reading a lot for an upcoming episode. Upcoming series of episodes, actually, listeners. So stay tuned for that. There will be an ongoing series where me and... Uh, a very fun guest will be going through the complete poems of Anne Sexton here. That is coming up, so stay tuned. But let's get into the first poem I marked, which was uh, Ode to the Penis. <laughs> Ode to the Penis. God, this is long. It's so long. They're all long. They're all ridiculously overwritten. And uh, this one is uh, what I called in. So let's read some of it. I called it insecure in the monologue, and I stand by that. I think there's, this has been a trope uh, since basically the kind of 70s, 60s feminists, uh, where there's kind of this uh, envy of the penis. Um, and I think it's confused, you know, it's a confused uh, sense of, of feminism here. Uh but yeah, let's get to it. Uh, Ode to the Penis. Someone told me that what I write about men is objectifying. So I ask you, O oh general idea of the penis, do you mind being noticed? You who stand in the mind, erect and not, old and young, for all your representations, O oh abstract principle, haven't you been, haven't you maybe been waiting for your turn to be praised? I think... You're lovely and brave, and so interesting. You are like a creature with your head and trunk, as if you have a life of your own. But you are innocent. You are not your own man. You are no more responsible for your actions than the matter of the brain for its thoughts. And you've had a mixed history. You've been taken into carnage as the instrument of it and you yourself have been played to produce the desperate screams often you have not been protected nor used to protect and oft not been respected nor wielded to respect and yet most of your history has been spent in joy and i wonder how it has felt being so adored as you have been and feared and what is it like for you if you could look down from your platonic cloud of categories when two of you are engaged together or married yourself primed yourself to your own power <sighs> god these line breaks and being a concept are you smart do you know you're equal to your sister concept and even that and even that you came from her back at the invention of the separate male the ovaries heavy, 
the ovaries heavying down toward the earth, the organ of orgasm growing and growing. I cannot imagine you from within, but as a sage said of a god, I do not want to be sugar. I want to taste sugar. And that's just my heteromania talking. And you're not homo or hetero or visible or manifest. You do not exist, except as an imaginary quorum of all your instances. So I'm not flirting with you. I'm just saying I like you, not as an object, but a subject, a prime mover, a working theory of plumbing and ecstasy, a boy's pride and anxiety with sock of Zephyr and Gale, half of the equation of creation. <sighs> All right, so I ended up reading this whole thing, but you guys can tell me what you think here. But one, you heard me read these line breaks. Uh, I usually try to read them, obviously. And uh, maybe you can tell me what this is talking about. I find this to be so general um, that it's even kind of... The reason I call it insecure is it seems it gets afraid to even be feminist, right? Like, it, do, it wants to um, degrade the penis, but it seems kind of afraid to. I think it also kind of wants to celebrate the penis, but is kind of afraid to. Uh, this is why I called it kind of insecure, and I think this is why we kind of... The poem ends up saying nothing, right? It's just that, oh, you are half of the equation of creation. It's like, okay, um you know, what are we talking about here? Uh, I don't know. It, it just seems a little confused and a little all over the place. Like I said in the monologue, it's like a little jumbled, uh, a little kind of, you know, waiting for your turn to be praised. I think you're lovely and brave and so interesting. You are like a creature with your head and trunk. Oh my God, what a cliche. Uh, as if you have life, as if you have a life of your own, but you are innocent. You are not your own man. I mean, this, it's just going nowhere. This, and it, that's, this is a page and a half of just these crazy long, not even very poetic lines. There's not even really good descriptions in here. I mean, you guys just heard it. Maybe you can tell me if you think something's a good description, but, uh, I don't think so. A working theory of plumbing and ecstasy. I mean, I don't know. It's just not enough for me. It it feels like this this poem is just, it's in here to give cred to the kind of mm, feminist poetry that Olds got kind of famous for in the 80s and 90s. Um, I don't know. Because like I said, I think it's kind of a confused poem. It doesn't kind of go or lean in one way or the other. It certainly doesn't praise the penis. Um, and uh, like I said, I don't think it really degrades it either. It's kind of just the middling of the road. Uh, I don't know. And I mean, people have heard this term all the time, the kind of penis envy, right? And this comes out of feminism, right? Like... Uh, I mean, I don't want to get too much into that, but there's always the, the Camille Paglia was, uh, would always talk about the sex organs where, uh, the urination, right? The penis can, uh, urinate in, uh, many directions where it can, um, uh, I forget the exact quote. I'm going to fuck it up where it says the penis can, uh, water ground that's feet away from it, right? Conquer the ground. Whereas women can merely water the ground on which they stand, right? You can't, like, shoot your urine stream across places. Um, and then the argument, you know, I'm butchering that quote, but the argument usually is that, you know, that there's a major difference between the sex organs, for sure. And then somebody like Paglia would, uh, you know, make that kind of connection to the male uh, kind of disposition to conquer or something like that, uh, Maybe it's true. I don't know. You know, it's just a theory by a person, but yeah. All right, enough about penises, although this book wants to constantly talk about penises and vaginas. Uh, on page 10, Ode of Broken Loyalty, I just wanted to bring this one up, not because I liked it or anything, but I thought it was a really good example of, you know, Ode's atrocious line breaks. If you couldn't hear it in the last poem, um, uh, I want to go back to that day when it, break was broken in me, the loyalty break to family, when I was cut free, 
or cut myself free from the fully human and floated off like an astronaut untethered i want to go back to the hour some cord in my mind was cut and i no longer was fed by the placenta of the nuclear or extended family but aborted myself or was aborted from that house again but aborted break myself or was aborted from that house once torn break away comma uh, there it is once shunned and shunning it seemed there was break little i could not write about i felt break as if my inf- as if as if my disenfranchisement break had been undone that's just a few examples uh i don't want to read the whole thing but her line breaks are always atrocious. They've always been atrocious her whole um, her whole career. Uh, and then my note here is that it's really kind of random assortment of poems and themes in this, you know. And this is when I started, just page 10. And this is where I said in the monologue that I was like already trying to be like, okay, maybe I'm done with this. Maybe, like if I wasn't reading it for, um, you know, uh, this podcast, I would be very quick to set this aside and not read it again again another telling thing this is the this is the the second reprinting of this book the version i have and all the praise on the back all the blurbs are for a different book for stag's leap so you know do with that information what you will dear listeners it's always telling when the praise on the back of a poetry book is for a different poetry book and not the one in your hands hey i'm just saying right you know i'm not the only one But, uh, yeah, these aren't odes. Many of these are not odes. They are not praising in kind of the tradition of the odes. And, okay, somebody could say, sure, uh, they're trying to transform the the traditional ode. I don't think so, man. I think that's a stretch if you're going to say that. I think these are just random assortments. Uh, The themes are random, hardly connect. They're, they're, They're very surface level themes as well simply about kind of these feminist tropes and kind of about the sex organs and 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 giving birth and hymen tearing you know virginity loss or whatever uh yeah just not for me and again i say yeah these are hardly odes apart from the titles insisting they are like i said in the monologue you know not really odes to anything but let's move on let's let's go yeah ode to the condom and this is, I think this is telling, this is on page 19 of this book, listeners, and it's telling because one, it's one of the, it's one of the shortest poems in this collection, very short compared to all the others. And I also, this one stuck out because I thought it had some of the best figurative language, kind of like the most poetic elements out of all of her, all of the poems that I've read, you know, and this is me reading through when I made this note on page 19. So I'm barely through most of this, right? But you know, it is kind of ruined, by the end, I think, because again, you have to understand what I'm saying here. In 2016, everything changed. Uh, Everything went through social media, everything. Uh, And everything still goes through social media. Like there are, the, the rules of social media are being, are spilling out into the real world. And this was just the start of it. So I said in the monologue about how a lot of the themes and tropes in this are things you will hear as you scroll a timeline. And I don't care what social media uh, app you use, whatever app of choice, whatever addiction software of choice, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, um, YouTube is social media now. Uh, you know, that those algorithms feed you things that are popular and not even popular, like things that are tailored to you. And, uh, I've noticed recently that, like, again, since, like, 2016, like the last 10 years, a lot of poetry especially, and this is true in fiction, this is true in nonfiction, you know, reporting, all of this, but uh, especially in poetry, you'll notice a lot of these are just repeated tropes from the timeline. Whichever timeline you choose, they all overlap, listeners. Uh, these are just repeated. And this is why I like something like Ode to the Condom. I thought it was not as repeated until we get, of course, we get to the end here. 
it was not as repeated as like a trope from um, from the timeline. And and honestly, I would say this one resembles more of an ode because it actually does really praise all the way through, and it's much more focused. As I, as I mentioned, it's the shortest of the poems in this collection. So I think that might be why it works as well. It's more condensed. Uh, and, you know, I know a lot of listeners might disagree with this, but it's just when you're writing poetry, you're writing the most condensed form of literature there is. Not that the smaller the better necessarily. necessarily. It's just the matter of the, every word has to seriously pack a punch and meandering weakens that form. If you're meandering, you're doing fiction or something like that. You're not doing poetry. Poetry has no room for meandering. And I think a lot of Old's work uh, meanders and loses the plot and doesn't focus the way the form is supposed to focus. And, you know, that's fine. You can experiment with things, but again, I don't have to like it. I don't think it's good. In fact, I can think it's really fucking bad, which I do. So let me get a sip of coffee here. And let's read uh, Ode to the Condom and talk about it a little. Okay, Ode to the Condom. Rubber, safe, French letter, sleeve. Protector of the young, so young, they do not yet exist. Separator of male and female. Bundling board down the middle of a shaker bed. Machitska. Oof. Machitska. Is that a Jewish word? Uh, down the aisle of an Orthodox synagogue. Veil between the matters which create spirits. Trojan trumpet mute. Latex superfine reservoir tip. This is part of my favorite part, right? Trojan col- semicolon trumpet mute semicolon. Latex superfine reservoir tip. Ramesses, forex, some, na- some actually made of sheep intestine, sparkling, with mammalian life. I never liked you. Of course, I'd hardly recognize you now. God, terrible fucking line brick. What with your flavors, your ribbed, for her, your cap and bells. But bless you, separator of women and men, from abortion, separator of health, from death. Separator of male from male, of well from ill, costume of the life force, best friend of the earth. Uh, yeah, and like I said, this one I think has some of the more interesting figurative language and is more focused. We don't go meandering off, but I think it kind of also, you know, has that Sharon Olds quality where it doesn't say much. Uh, and but I think it follows the ode format more, where you're kind of praising, right? And it can be a mundane thing, like a condom, right? Like, that's fine. Like, you can praise a condom. You can praise a fucking glass of water if you want. Like, that's fine. But, you know, just find creative ways to do it. Make it fresh. Make it new. Make it interesting. Uh, And I just thought the last line was awful. The last line of this poem is, Life force, comma, best friend of the earth. Personally... I don't view condoms as best friend of the earth, but, you know, whatever. It kind of overexpands it, right? It kind of overexpands the idea. At least that's what I would say. But you guys, you know, let me know. Ode to the tampon. Hip replacement ode. Blah, blah, blah. Not a fan. Let's move to one other poem. Okay. <laughs> All right, on page 24 here, Ode to the Last 38 Trees in New York City Visible from This Window. Ugh. God, that title. Uh, so my note for this was example of bad writing and cliches. Poems seem to be random jumbles of thoughts slash ideas. Yeah, that's for sure. And I've already said that, so we'll read a little bit of this. I don't want to read the whole thing because this one's very long, again, stretching across two pages. Some of the repetitiveness, so for example, I just told you the title, right? Ode to the Last 38 Trees in New York City Visible from This Window. And then the very first line of this, the very first sentence, a thousand windows look down on them. Do we really need that, right? It's almost repetitive. We already know that we're looking out from this window, a specific window, her window, right? Probably her desk window with the window that sits above her desk or something while she's writing at home or in the NYU or whatever. Yeah, so that's one of them. Uh, one crown looks like a granite mountain, peeling its li- peeling in layers, a thousand breaths uh, a day. God, that break. A thousand breaths break a day, period. 
one looks, comma, from above, comma, like a bomb, comma, break, an exploded shell, comma, a thousand petals. One is thriving, one is a thriving colony of green ants milling a thousand workers. And this is the one that I put out as cliche with these terrible line breaks. One, when you're referring to like ants and workers, right, it's kind of a cliche here. Colony of green ants milling, right, a thousand workers. That strikes me as cliche. Uh, all right, I don't want to read any more of this, but that's just an example of the cliches that I'm talking about that are used. Again, somebody like Olds, like, I can't get over writers of this caliber, institutional praise and institutional power that they have. Olds is very well regarded in the community. And you read the poems, and there's, like, glaring cliches. Like, for me, like, it, it's... Whenever I'm going over a poem of mine, like, I am constantly looking for cliches, constantly trying to criticize my own shit for cliches. And, you know, maybe you don't catch all of them. Sure, you know, let's be fair. But I'm just like, damn. Like, but this is what I mean when I say there's no, like, editor working at any publishing house right now who can work with a poet. And I said this on the Ada Limon episode. You can go back and listen to that, listeners. With her latest book, I was just kind of shocked that like, man, you know, there's there no editor at these publishing houses that specializes in just poetry because they need it, man. Like they need somebody that's able to point certain things out and just give them a little note, you know? And right now, poetry is in this weird position where people think that anything goes because to some extent you can do anything, but it also like when anything goes, it also becomes not a poem, right? Like there are structures, there are boundaries and boundaries actually are a good thing when it comes to creating, like, like you need certain limitations sometimes in order to get, you know, to whittle out what you're trying to whittle out of the block of wood. Otherwise, it's just a block of wood. Even that, right, like the canvas is the boundary and art, like a, the, the, how big the block of wood is, is the boundary for, you know, sculpture or whittling or something. And for poetry, yeah, it's the page, right? It's the page, but then there's also these kind of structures within the page that help to get across what you're trying to get across, you know? And I don't know, I just, it really disappointing that there's nobody out there who can work with, with, with poets who have the chops to, to rein them in a little bit. You know, like this is a very common practice in fiction to have editors rein in a writer who's going a little too far or something like that. And we just don't have that in poetry. And it's really hurting, man. It is really hurting. And I mean, you know, you guys have heard me say this all the time. You know, the editors at most of these magazines are not good. Like, one, they usually have pretty bad taste. And two, they don't even know what they're looking at half the time. Like, somebody like Olds, like I said, she's gotten to this point in her career, won all the prizes you can win, uh, has a tenured teaching job, um, which don't exist any longer for anybody trying to break through. And it just, it, it does not know the difference between a good line break, like good enjambment and bad enjambment. It does not know the difference and doesn't seem to care to know the difference. And no editor seems to care to know the difference. And it just kind of makes me think like, why does nobody care about this art form? And people are like, oh no, I care about it deeply. No, you don't. If you don't care about things like that. Okay. Uh, so that's my take on that one. Yeah. Let's go to, yeah, let's go to blowjob ode. And there's always these, there's these sections. There's like seven sections in these books, in this book, um, that just, th there's no reason to have sections at all in this book, but you know, they're there. Let's get a few toots on the vape here. Let's get some nicotine. I am moving slow this morning. I'm sorry, listeners. You could hear me when I was reading this. I was fucking up the reading and my eyes aren't working as quickly few too many drinks shout out to eric we were uh we were out there uh out there having some drinks last night and this is the one you guys talked me talk about in the monologue the blowjob ode on page 45 of uh how it says very little and is very literal 
in the sense, like kind of trying to be funny by being literal. Be like, oh, it's a job, ha ha, tee hee, tee hee. Uh, and I just, I'm not a fan of that shit. It's very Gen X. That's very, uh, there's a few things that Gen Xers do in their writing. And I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the Gen X writers, but it's this, this kind of literalness where they break down a phrase in the most literal way possible as quote unquote humor, or there's this kind of kind of DFW, um, Franzen style where they, and this is more in prose where they give you so much like detail. It's like scientific level of detail and that's supposed to be humor. And it just, I don't like those two tropes from Gen X. I think I just can't stand them. Gen Xers can keep it, keep that shit away from me. But then again, when you think of like millennial tropes, like, you know, are there any even millennial tropes are just to write bad books, <laughs> I guess. But, uh, blowjob ode. I never thought of it as a line. Oh my God, this line break. I never thought of it as a line as I never thought of it as a line break of work, period. <sighs> I did not think of myself with my lunch pail going to my profession and punching the time clock in and out surely the practice was not divided into management who were owners and staff who had no share in the profit job is that what they thought that it was boring for us and we couldn't wait till we could break for lunch they thought they were rulers commanding us against our will it's weird thinking about it from a boss's point of view looking down at the working head, the alienated labor, looking down the pay scale, but, but, and then that's just a period, but, period. So let's say this line, uh, the alienated break labor, M dash, looking down the pay scale, period, but, period, if we break were both engaged in the same act, it wouldn't be employment, would it, but play. Play in the house of the gods of pleasure. Oh my god, gods of pleasure. What a cliche. At least blow is not a word from commerce. But the golden rule of music, no, as you would be known, blow as you would be blown. Teehee. Teehee, isn't that funny? Teehee. Understand it. Again, this is... Saying nothing, I put it like I said in that it says nothing. Here's my notes. It says nothing, and there's a literalist, like a literalness, attempting to be a joke. And it's an easy, unfunny, random assortment of lame. That's what I put in my notes. <laughs> a deconstruction that lacks saying anything about it. I just it, it drives me nuts. This type of shit and. I hate it. <laughs> I fucking hate it. I would honestly prefer like a feminist angle to this or something like about like hating blowjobs, but it isn't even that. And yeah, about like the work it is or anything like that or about the power it is, like the power that's implied from it. Like, um, Anne Rand famously had this stuff about like the power dynamic of blowjobs where she would talk about blowing men is gives the power to women. Um, you know, it's an interesting take, uh, interesting idea that could be explored, you know, something like this. Cause I think that old is hinting at something like this in, in this poem, but also, you know, it, it tries to be too playful and funny. So because of that, it becomes a joke in of itself, right? And again, it is an ode to a blowjob. It is blowjob ode. And, you know, ode in these this titles mean nothing. <sighs> yeah. And that's the last one that I had marked, really. I didn't want to do... I mean, most of these were not entertaining to me. It was kind of a chore to get through this book. Um, really, just... I am not a fan. I'm not a fan of sharing olds and... Uh, Nobody else should be either. <laughs> so, uh, 
there's that. But yeah, you know, so there are nine poems in here that have to do with vaginas or period blood or hymens or something like that. And I don't want to go into all of them, but there's just, it kind of makes me, it's this thing, right? Like it's more attitude than craft. And that's what irritates me about this collection. It's relying on the brashness and the attitude of olds more than it is presenting us with, you know, artistic craft, poetics, figurative language, all of that. It's relying on this kind of fuck you attitude. And that's important sometimes. I think the tone and stuff, are they're very important, right? I'm never going to say they're not. But, you know, you just need more than that. Especially like these these writers like olds who are so celebrated, so awarded. There's nothing left for them to be awarded and celebrated for. They could be doing anything. They could be trying to push these boundaries beyond what we know and even think about with poems. And they're not, you know. And that's what really irritates me about it. These fucking Gen X writers and their fucking bullshit. We're back. I don't know. Is she a boomer? Because she's old enough to be a boomer. Because if she was almost 60 at the time of writing this, I mean, she's almost 70 now. So that's more boomer territory than uh, Gen X. But the boomers, too. You know, at least the boomers were doing some, some experimental shit post 1960s. But, you know, that kind of fell off, too. Yeah, you know. What can you do? But that's my overall thoughts on uh, Odes by Sharon Olds. And, you know, you guys let me know what you think. Let me know what books you want me to cover and uh, all that. So send it in, send it in. Uh, you know, join Patreon, patreon.com slash heavyboard. Please helps this podcast, helps support us. You can join the chat, make a little community of people that are like-minded, interested, want to think like this, want to talk about things like this. Uh, share their ideas about it, go, you know, hop in, uh, join the heavy board book club. That's at the $10, uh, double ply tier and up. We can, uh, we're going to have some fun with that. I think the first one we're going to do is, uh, Gertrude Stein's tender buttons. And we're putting a list together of books to cover. And that's going to be fun to talk about with you all out there. So if you want to participate in things like these, you know, please feel free to join. Uh, you can reach me, heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. Send in your workshop stories, send in your thoughts, send in your requests, all of that. Uh, it's a good way to reach us. And then, of course, uh, check out the YouTube channels. Leave us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, you know, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, like, subscribe, uh, share the YouTube channels, at heavyboard, at heavyboard clips. And, uh, yeah, you know, this has been another episode of heavy board. See ya. Heavy. Board. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy board. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.